The Red Guards are one of the less frequently seen races in all of the mainline Elder Scrolls games so far. And the main reason for this is that they're primarily situated in the western border of Elder Scrolls, and most likely where Elder Scrolls VI will take place, Hammerfell. You see, the Yakutans, the original Red Guards, fled their homeland Yakuta after it was reportedly enveloped by the sea thousands of years ago, finding their way to a new landmass, Tamriel. But in many ways, even more interesting than the Red Guards themselves is what they potentially left behind on Yakuta another massively powerful and lesser known race called the Sinestral Elves, or the Left-Handed Elves, as referred to by the Yakutans. They were called this by the Red Guards or Yakutans because of the conflicts they constantly met themselves in. The Yakutans saw them as the opposite of the right way, and thus called them the Left-Handed Elves. And this may have been for good reason. The Sinestral Elves were said to have unbelievable power and grasp over nature and dark magics, rumored to be in constant communication with Daedra and sacrificing to their gods. The Elves erected some of the largest and most impressive towers and structures in all of Nern, and tales were told of how some of their greatest sorcerers could raise entire metropolises from beneath the sands hidden from the naked eye. Their skin was said to be pitch black, with many members of their society donning many bright and colorful hair, garments, and jewelry. Their cities were paved with gold and riches, and their patrons enjoyed many luxuries even the Septum Empire could only dream of. The constant conflict between the Yakutans and the Elves eventually led to the destruction of the Elves though, after many great battles where the very few survivors are said to have died with the sinking of the landmass as the Yakutans left. Sadly, this is the extent of the well-written history and rumors we hear about the elves in some of the texts throughout the series. The real most interesting things about the Sinestral Elves, though, is what we don't know. For instance, one rumor argues that the sinking of Yakuta may actually have been the work of the Sinestral Elves themselves, in retaliation for Yakuta wiping out their race. We know that they had great power over nature and could raise cities from the sand, so maybe they could also submerge an entire continent in water. And if this rumor is true, how is it that the elves could have garnered such great strength? Was it their connection to the Daedra and Oblivion that gave them this edge? Another interesting observation about the Sinestral Elves as well is that they are one of, if not the only race of elves we know of, that don't stem from the Altmer. You see, all elves in Tamriel stem from an original elvish people, called the Altmer, who originally settled the Somerset Isles and then spread out across Tamriel and formed into new elf races like the Bosmer Wood Elves in Valenwood or the Dark Elves in Morrowind, and many more. But the Sinestral Elves are entirely different, and it begs the question, where did they come from? And was there an elvish father race beyond just the Altmer that we actually know nothing about? Could they all be descendants of the Elnafe, who apparently all Tamrielic Elves stem from at one point? A mystery we may never find out. While the mainline Elder Scrolls games only take us across the continent of Tamriel, there are many other landmasses that reside across Nern, each with their own rich history, lore, and people. The most notable of these, though, is Akavir, a massive landmass said to dwarf Tamriel that is just east and across a vast ocean. The land is home to four main ruling dominions. To the south, we have the Kang Mao, a race of civilized talking monkeys that live in floating rock cities. To the north, the Kamal, frozen demon giants that thaw out once a year to wage war. To the east, the Kopau Toon, a sprawling empire of talking tiger men. And finally, and the most dominant race over the region to the west, is the Saesi, a vampiric serpent army very capable in battle. In essence, Akavir is really just one degenerate zoo. There have been many expeditions from Tamriel's greatest kings and leaders to conquer parts of Akavir, but all have led to spectacular failure, usually with armies landing in the southwestern portion of the continent and meeting their death to the Saesi and horrible weather conditions. 
Even the past great emperor, Uriel V, is said to have succumbed to his death while invading Akavir many moons ago. And in fact, even the Sayesi themselves have done the reverse and invaded Tamriel, where they took over massive sections of land, and one Sayesi leader named Vera Suche even established themselves for a short period as the potentate and main ruler of the Cyrodiilic Empire. But these events are still shrouded in great mystery, and many people of the modern eras do not even believe a majority of the stories, which makes the questions of this distant land even more interesting. Where did the Sayesi get their power? What are the Kamal really like? And are the stories and writings of this land and its amazing megastructures and underground caverns true? Or is it all just fairy tales? It is even claimed by some divine gods that Akavir is the true home of Nern, with Tamriel simply being a little brother story that we see in the mainline games. Tamriel is host to many great towers, whether it be the Red Tower at Morrowind's Volcano or the glorious White Gold Tower, also known as the Imperial Palace in the center of Cyrodiil, the centerpiece of the biggest city in Oblivion's mainline game. But perhaps the most interesting tower is actually the Adamantine Tower in High Rock, which is host to one of the most important lore events of all time. Also called the Zero Tower, the Adamantine Tower was built with perfectly smooth zero stones that made the walls glisten in the light, and it is the birthplace of what modern civilizations call Convention. You see, in Elder Scrolls, Convention was a major event during the Dawn Era, where Akatosh, after the betrayal from Lorcan, banished his heart to Morrowind, and along with this, devised the Edada, the original spirits that ruled over the new land of Nern. These Etada were called gods and demons by the humans, and Adra and Daedra by the Aldmer or elves. This adamantine tower was in many ways the birthplace of modern day Nern, but even to this day it houses many dark and interesting secrets. Deep within its walls lies a peculiar device called the Argent Aperture, a giant ring of 13 concentric circles of which the meaning no one knows to this day. It is said that this megastructure could simply be a clock tracking the progression of each of the eras the world has progressed through so far. But some philosophers think that this device may actually be a riddle, which if unlocked could be a doorway to an entirely new realm beyond our comprehension, a realm above the gods, the Daedra, and above life itself. And as one of the oldest, if not the oldest structure in Tamriel, this adamantine tower presents an amazing amount of possibilities as to just why the and as one of the oldest, if not the oldest structures in all of Tamriel, the adamantine tower presents an amazing amount of possibilities as to what might be behind the Argent aperture that's housed inside. Whiterun is one of the most well-known cities in all of the Elder Scrolls series and one of the first towns most Skyrim players will come across. What is less well known though, is a small village on the very outskirts of White Run's holdings, a farming village referred to as Rorikstead. While most of White Run is known for its horrible soil and bad weather, Rorikstead, for some unknown reason, actually has amazing soil, and thus is the main supplier for crops to the entire city of White Run. But what on the surface seems to be a happy and productive community of farmers may be hiding something much more sinister. First of all, the current leader of the Hold, and who the village is named after, Rorik, claims that the Enclave has only existed for almost 30 years, and that he founded it after serving as a man in the army. But there just so happens to be three books in Skyrim that actually mention Rorikstead, and each of these references is well beyond 30 years old one being from the second era 1600 years ago, and another being well over 4,000. Is Rorik lying to us? Did he simply find the town barren and rename it after himself to act as if he was the leader and trick others? Or could he actually be some sort of demented being that has been here for over a millennia? It only gets weirder from here though. You see, in the town there's a young girl named Sissel, and if you talk to her, she briefly mentions how in her dreams she has been seeing a kind-hearted gray dragon, 
and she has foreseen some kind of prophecy. This sounds eerily similar to the prophecy we envision from Parthenax, the hidden gray dragon only the dragonborn and the graybeards know of. So how would it be this innocent little girl has any idea about the coming conflict of the main story? If we follow her around for some time, we will eventually discover that she has a close relationship with another man in the town named Joanne, who is the village healer and has taken a special liking to Sissel, seeing some sort of potential in her and inviting her to his house often. On the surface, this could simply be a nice old man trying to teach a young child some useful skills. But hidden in Joanne's home, in one of his desks, is a very peculiar book. The Spirit of Daedra. A book we only see three times in all of Skyrim, one of them being here. The book is very rare, and it's a sacred Daedric and demonic presence. And the fact that Joanne even has it is especially terrifying. But it only gets worse. Because the town of Rorikstead has almost no woman. Most of the men you talk to mention how their wives or mothers were lost, and that the village healer, Joanne, was not able to save them. But what if Joanne had not failed to save these women, but rather succeeded in killing them? Maybe the reason this small and quaint village actually has such rich and healthy soil isn't just pure chance, but actually the work of a Daedric worshipping crazy man, Joanne, who is sacrificing the fertile woman in the town in order to guarantee good crop yields. Camelworks, an amazing Elder Scrolls YouTuber, even went deeper into this theory and found that Lund's Hut, a small building located right behind Rorikstead, may even hold more evidence. In the hut, we find a deceased man named Lund, who has apparently taken his life with poison we find on the table. And next to his hut, we find a memorial of sorts, with flowers and candles, as well as a wedding ring, which seems to imply he has sought his end with sadness after losing his wife. Yet another female who has left us in close proximity to Rorikstead. And most damning of all, if you are able to actually clip through the game bounds in this hut, you are met with mysterious and ominous green glowing mist in the abyss of nothing. Except for one book. The Book of Daedra. Suspended in mid-air in an area no players are ever supposed to be able to get to. Could this be a clue from the developers that this little town may in fact be hiding one big secret? Another mystery left unsolved.